Uh, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Very welcome to this session. Could I just a few housekeeping things? Switch off your mobile phones, which I take the advice myself as well. Um, and uh, we, uh, the initial address, as usual, we operate to the Chatham House rule of the initial address is is uh, on the record and the question and answer uh, session afterwards is, uh, is according to Chatham House rules. Um, now, um, this morning, we have, uh, this afternoon rather, we have a very important subject to my mind, uh, the, the subject of Macron. Uh, since his remarkable election in 2017, he has been rarely out of news in France or somewhere else, and certainly in Europe. Uh, he seems to be uh, extraordinary with his energy, with his intellectual prowess, and so many other things, and makes one really envious, I have to say, at this time of my life, when, when all, all of these things are failing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he has been, to say the least, controversial, and no more controversial than in the last fortnight or so with his uh, interview uh, with The Economist, uh, in which uh, he talked about a lot of things, but the thing that has attracted attention is, the, uh, is his remarks about NATO and using the term brain dead is hardly going to win you friends in NATO or indeed in a lot of the Eastern European countries and indeed elsewhere. Uh, but he has been controversial in France, of course. Uh, the Gilets Jaunes, I think, almost saw the end of them. It was touch and go whether he would survive. He did survive. He went out into the countryside, presented his case to all and sundry, and he seems to rely on argument and trying to convince people than, uh, than, uh, than any other way. Uh, but uh, he's now faced, of course, with upcoming elections. The elections come around very, very quickly. The local elections, of course, uh, early next year. And of course, there's the big one of the presidential election. Now, he... he the Assemblée Nationale is dominated by his own party, which he founded, La République en Marche. Again, an extraordinary leap in the dark, really. Uh, and a lot of those people are without political experience. And this may have been a thing that has dogged Macron as well. He hadn't got the old wily, experienced politicians that that, uh, that the Socialist Party certainly had, and which indeed the, the, the centre-right had. Uh, and uh, this is sometimes shown in his decisions and so on. But he's, he's certainly courageous and so on. So it's a matter, and I don't know in fact where Europe would be without this figure, because I don't see anything else coming out about where Europe is going how it defends itself now in the presence of Trump and all he's saying, uh, how it's going vis-a-vis -vis Africa. Macron has raised all of these things, uh, particularly in a speech to the Sorbonne in September 2017, which by any stretch of the imagination was an incredible speech and Will, will stand the test of time, I think, in the main. Of course, there are things that are totally, uh, totally uh, unachievable in it, but there is a lot that Europe would need. But the, there doesn't seem to be any reaction coming from Europe on these things. Even on the NATO thing, okay, we know that Poland and these countries are frightened by his remarks about getting close to Putin, you know, it's not exactly popular these days. Uh, but uh, in that, of course, Macron is only repeating what the goal said. There can be no Europe without Russia. Uh, so anyway, look, uh, 
<laughs> we have we have a speaker with us to, to say all of these. You're quite right. You've, you've took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Victor Victor is uh, is a wonderful person to have with us. He started his career really reporting French politics with with Reuters in 1982. Uh, he's going on, gone on to serve with, for, with the Financial Times in Africa, Asia, uh, uh, and parts of Europe, and uh, is now bureau chief for the Financial Times in Paris. He has written several books. I won't go into them, but uh, you can Google all of these things. So, Victor, you're very, very welcome. I'm delighted you're with us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes, you. Thanks. Thank you very much, and it's great to be uh, invited to the IIEA. Thank you very much. We had a very high-powered lunch with a lot of uh, scarily knowledgeable and, uh, and intelligent people, but um, so it uh, put me in a nervous mood for this. But no, it's really great to be back in Dublin. I last came a couple of years ago for the Dorky Book Festival, uh, and I came also for my nephew's wedding. He was also married in Dorky. Um, and, uh, and uh, I'm still sort of kept in touch with Ireland by your wonderful ambassador in Paris, Patricia O'Brien, who, uh, who really you know, keeps us very well informed about what's going on here and the connections with France and the chaos of Brexit and its impact on Ireland, impact across Europe. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I never heard of the land bridge until I met her and she was telling me all about the importance of the, the trading routes that run um, through, uh, through England to get to, to, get to Ireland. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, French President Emmanuel Macron and his, uh, as you described, very active foreign policy and what it means for Europe and the world. And, and when I say active, um, you, you, you mentioned the, um, the NATO comments, uh, an outburst almost, uh, in an interview uh, in The Economist. He ruffled a lot of feathers by saying that NATO was suffering from, from brain death. Uh, he's also... Um, throwing his weight around in Europe and European institutions, although it has to be said this is not new for France. France and, and Germany have obviously always been the prime, prime movers in the EU, uh, and, and uh, it's been a French tradition to, to try and uh, impose itself on Brussels, and that still continues. Um, but he's also made very controversial statements about uh, European enlargement and taken positions that are very controversial, for example, keeping uh, Macedonia and Albania out of the... Um, enlargement process or the application process. Um, but he's also done a lot of other things like um, trying to make peace in Ukraine um, and uh, to ease the crisis in the Gulf. He's become, in a sense, Europe's Trump whisperer uh, and perhaps, you know, the man best qualified to bring uh, the rather errant US president to heel. And I'll come back to some of those uh, in a minute. Um, I should start by saying that he does, uh, as you mentioned, he does excite uh, strong passions, Macron, and, and s certainly in France, but even, even abroad. And I hope I can count myself as reasonably detached from this, because I've only been in France this time for about a year, um, and, but I did spend previous stints in France when Mitterrand was president uh, and when Chirac was, was president. Um, and now, yeah, so Macron has just been um, for, the, for the past year. And I, I didn't witness his extraordinary rise to power except uh, from a distance in, in 2017. Um, so I'm not uh, a fanatically devoted Macronist, uh, as some of his, his uh, followers are, but nor am I a sort of angry Macron-hating detractor, as a lot of people are um, in, in France, and uh, especially, I think, quite a few uh, people in the French press and certainly on the French left, there's quite a lot of... Uh, anger and, and even hatred of, of Macron at the moment. But he is, you know, whether you, you love him or hate him, he's certainly a fascinating figure to study for historians and for, and for journalists like myself. Um, so to try and explain what it is that he's been doing, um, I'm going to take you back um, to a statement that he made to uh, French ambassadors who were gathered in Paris for the annual uh, meeting at the end of August. And then I'm just going to mention briefly the French Revolution. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going. I think this is quite an important speech that he made, and I'm just going to paraphrase the French here. I've, I've got the French quotation here, but he says, "I think um, France's vocation is is what is required now, which is to try and impose ourselves on the world order with the cards that we have, and not to give up to the uh, inevitable 
things that are being done by other people, but to try and build a new order in which um, not only we would have our place, we as in France, but also um, the interest that we have would also have their place. So um, I believe in only one thing, this is what he said, it is the strategy of audacity, la stratégie de l'audace, the, and the taking of risk, la prise de risque, strategy of audacity and taking of risk. Now remember, this was to ambassadors, to diplomats, he's saying this. And what that means is um, that maybe a lot of the things we are doing, this is still Macron speaking, uh, maybe they won't succeed, and there'll be a lot of commentators who will say that uh, we failed at certain times, and that is not a problem, he said. Um, what is a problem, what is absolutely fatal today, is to not try and do what we need to do, given what I've just said. So my strategy is one of audacity, boldness, it's a vision, and it's to try and uh, find in this uh, uh, context a way of um, uh, re-founding European civilization. Uh, and I think that's what should be our aim in this country and our uh, European strategy and our international strategy. So I, that's a, a bit of a paraphrase, so it's not as elegant as his original French. Um, but So the key concept here is, is clearly audacity, boldness, and that was conveniently explained to us by uh, Le Drian, his uh, foreign minister, a couple of days later in his closing speech to the same French ambassadors. And he ended up by quoting uh, Danton, the French uh, revolutionary, uh, wh whose phrase uh, was, um, de l'audace, encore de l'audace, toujours de l'audace. So uh, audacity, more audacity, always audacity. Um, and that was a, a short but very famous speech that he made in the assembly in uh, 1792 to rally the revolutionaries against the approaching um, Austrians and, and Prussians and, and French monarchists. And the call to save revolutionary France was indeed a success in the days that followed uh, that speech by Danton. But um, Le Drian didn't actually mention that Danton was executed by guillotine less than two years <laughs> later in the terror. But that is, uh, that is what happened. So, um, uh, in, so audacity is the, the key to hit the way he thinks about what he's doing and the, the manner in which he does it. Uh, and in talking about his modus operandi, we should also not forget, and a couple of people mentioned this at lunch, that he explicitly models himself on Charles de Gaulle, um, who was, of course, almost alone among French leaders in keeping alight the flame of the free French after the Nazi occupation of France and the formation of the, of the Vichy government. Churchill found de Gaulle impossibly arrogant and difficult, uh, but stuck with him uh, to the very end, because de Gaulle was right about the really important things. Uh, and incidentally, was also extraordinarily perceptive about a lot of uh, international events from Algeria to the, the progress of the Second World War, both militarily and in terms of alliances, and uh, the Vietnam War and many others. Um, if, if you look back um, over his life and the statements he made, he really was extraordinarily perceptive about a lot of things on international policy. So um, Macron's audacity, some people have called it disruptive diplomacy, I think that's the, that's the title of, of the talk. It's about constant movement and energy. Uh, one of my colleagues, Sylvie Kaufman, uh, said his enemies were immobility and paralysis. These are the kind of attributes of the way he acts, of his diplomacy, of his, of his international strategy. But we should recognize that one reason he is so prominent um, one reason he stands out as a protagonist uh, uh, is that it's in a very particular context in Europe at the moment. The rest of the stage is occupied mostly by minor actors or diminished actors. Uh, Britain, even under the ebullient uh, Boris Johnson, who likens himself to Churchill, uh, not aptly, I think, but does. So Britain is fatally distracted by Brexit. Uh, Angela Merkel in Germany is in, clearly in the closing years of her leadership, and the coalition in Germany, as, as we know from the news over the weekend, is in very deep trouble about, about the SPD. Spain and Italy are embroiled in uh, internal political tussles in which uh, populists or the far right have, have made gains. Trump is... Trump? Well, Trump, you know, he's... Now, his strategies, uh, well, Trump's strategies on, all, on almost all fronts uh, seem to be incoherent and quite often damaging to U.S. interests, let alone those of, of U.S. allies. Um, we, I mean, we could have a whole talk about that, but that's <laughs> not the moment. Um, so let's look at some of the issues where Macron has been rocking the boat, where he's been accused of overstepping, uh, overstepping the mark. Uh, 
and I'm not going to endorse him, but um, uh, I'm going to argue that he's not quite as outrageous as his detractors make out. Um, if you take NATO, the, 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 the key issue you mentioned, it's meeting for its summit in London uh, tomorrow. Uh, we need to look at exactly what he, what he said and in what context. He did say NATO was suffering from brain death, uh, but he said it in the context of the US, the sudden US withdrawal from northeast Syria of its forces and Turkey's subsequent invasion of uh, northern Syria. And there was no consultation either by the Americans or the Turks on this with, and they're both members of NATO, uh, and uh, Macron's argument is they should have, they should have consulted. Um, uh, so as Macron pointed out, you have no coordination whatsoever of strategic decision making between the United States and its NATO allies, none. You have an uncoordinated aggressive action by another NATO ally, Turkey, in an area where our interests are at stake. Um, and he said he had no problem with the military interoperability of, of NATO, but strategically and politically we need to recognize we have a problem. I don't think it's, you know, it's, it, he is right uh, in what he says, although you can argue with how he said it. Uh, he's also called into question the future of Article 5, which obliges uh, members to provide mutual assistance in the event of, of an attack. Uh, in a way, that's probably a more significant statement than what he said about brain death and, and Turkey. Um, Angela Merkel immediately criticized his drastic words. Polish and other leaders were quick to condemn what they saw as an attack, uh, attack on NATO. But again, if you look at the days that followed, uh, Heiko Maas, the German foreign minister, was more or less echoing Macron in slightly more moderate language a couple of days later, calling for NATO cohesion, for Europe to take more responsibility for its security. Uh, Charles Michel, uh, the incoming head of the European Council, also took a pretty Macronist line uh, in an interview with, with my paper with the FT, uh, saying that the EU needed to do more to ramp up its joint defense capabilities and avoid becoming collateral damage uh, in the tensions between the US and China. Um, now, when they interpret Macron's words, his advisors in Paris uh, make it clear that he did not make a gaffe, he did not speak by accident. It was quite deliberate because he didn't want uh, the NATO summit, which is a 70th anniversary celebration, just to be another photo op. Uh, and I think it's fair to say he has succeeded in doing that. He has succeeded in ensuring that there will be some uh, serious discussion that takes place. Um, so that's NATO. Moving on to, to Europe more, more broadly, I think um, uh, it's crucial that to, to, to understand that the French recognize, and, and Macron said this himself, that it's not simply enough to wait out Donald Trump and hope that he's replaced by a US president, as US president, by somebody who's more rational and more Atlanticist than, than he is. Um, so Macron spoke of the exceptional fragility of Europe and, of course, its need to build its own defense security and technology strategy rather than merely rely on the Americans. Um, and he then said their position has shifted over the past 10 years, and it hasn't only been the Trump administration. You have to understand what is happening deep down in American policymaking. It's the idea put forward by Obama, who said, I am a Pacific president. So this is um, America's famous uh, pivot to Asia. And again, I think Macron is, is right on this, uh, and he's not even the first person to say it, but he does say things in a, in a dramatic uh, and attention-grabbing manner. Um, and anyone who's followed Macron uh, since he was swept to power in the 2017 presidential election can hardly claim to be amazed by the kind of things he's saying and doing two years later. You mentioned that speech in September 2017 at the Sorbonne. He laid out a very typically ambitious, uh, typically for him, ambitious European agenda in the speech, uh, in that speech at the Sorbonne, calling, among other things, for a military intervention force, a common military budget by 2020, uh, a European agency to push radical innovation in the economy, a European public prosecutor, a carbon tax at the frontier on imports into the EU, harmonization of corporate tax rates. The list, uh, as you said, is very long. And in a way, what is surprising is um, not how many of these, these things have gone nowhere, but how many of them have either actually been done or are being in the process of being done or, in, or indeed are being contemplated quite actively by other members of the European Union as well. Um, now, none of this means that Macron and the French have not made mistakes. They, they definitely have. Um, but I think his principal message, 
that he has for Europe and his European partners is, is the right ones, uh, the right one. It's not just that Europeans must do more for their own security and must stand united, but they, they, they're doing so for a particular reason, which is that they need to be able to negotiate as a superpower, at least as an economic superpower, um, that can defend its interests, whether they're commercial interests or technological interests or strategic interests, in the face of an increasingly unilateralist United States and an increasingly aggressive China. Um, so it is hard to argue, I think, with Macron's view uh, that, the, for example, you, you look at the, the rollout of 5G telecoms, the issue there, and, and Huawei, the issue there is when it comes to um, the, the manufacturing process, it's about Chinese manufacturers. Um, when it comes to data and the way data is handled around the world, we're talking about American tech and in internet platforms. And in both cases, Europe is, uh, both in terms of sort of software and hardware, as it were, is being at the le left at the mercy of, of foreign providers. Um, and that's where a lot of his industrial nationalism, if you like, comes from. Um, and, his, uh, and his decision, um, again, we mentioned this at the lunch, it's very uh, important, I think, that his decision, Macron's decision, when he met Xi Jinping this year in Paris for a summit at the, at the Elysee, he deliberately invited Angela Merkel and Juncker to come with him for that meeting um, to meet Xi Jinping uh, to, and, and, and most people think this was a pretty smart act of, of diplomacy. Uh, and I think, again, I think it was too. And the reason for that is that I've, I've worked many years in Asia and I'm absolutely certain that uh, if you have a strong and united stand in defense of your interests, that is really the only strategy that works uh, in dealing with China. And it's the only strategy that carries any weight in Beijing. Um, I didn't think I would have to mention this word, but just when we're talking about European unity, we probably have to talk about Brexit very briefly. Uh, again, Macron's been faulted in both London and Brussels um, for being overly antagonistic, uh, for example, by opposing lengthy extensions to the Brexit procedure. Um, uh, and Macron and his advisers just say th they're being realistic. Um, they didn't want Brexit in the first place, and they're just trying to ensure the continuation of, obviously, the stability of the EU itself, but also they want a very strong Franco-British bilateral defense and security relationship to continue afterwards. And since the British people voted for Brexit, Macron's view is that they should get it, and the sooner the uncertainty is out of the way, the better. Um, and, and you could argue that this is a kind of gaullist trait of just being realistic about what's happened. Um, and it's, it's that sort of realism, that sense of taking the facts as they are rather than trying to pretend that something has happened that hasn't happened is, is one reason why I think he's become quite good at dealing with Donald Trump. Um, at, at the G7 summit in Biarritz, he, Macron kept on talking about how uh, there was no point, um, you know, that a lot of the things that the Europeans hate about Trump are simply things that he promised to do in his election campaign. And Macron's view is, we've got to move on. You know, if he, if he pulled out of the climate accord, now Macron would say, there's no way we can get him back in. We just have to work around it and deal with it, deal with the situation um, as it is. Um, so unlike Trump, and unlike several other prominent world leaders today, including, I think we could say, Boris Johnson across the Irish Sea, Macron is extremely well read. He has a great sense of history. And he is kind of relentlessly logical and Cartesian in the way he considers the great uh, international policy questions of our, of our time. Um, when he was asked at the beginning of his, um, his Economist interview whether he wasn't being too somber and overdramatic about the state of Europe, he, he just recalled the triumph of peace in post-war Europe and noted uh, alarming things that would have been absolutely unthinkable five years ago, the exhausting mayhem of Brexit, an EU struggling to find a common voice, uh, and an American ally turning its back, um, as, he, as, he, as he was quoted as saying, an American ally turning its back on us so quickly on strategic issues. Again, he's, he's not wrong. Um, just a couple of other big foreign policy issues that I think it's worth looking at um, to, to sort of try and understand the way Macron works and the way he thinks. Um, he's pushing uh, a couple of things. One is uh, Iran and the Gulf. 
And it's striking how much effort uh, Macron has put into trying to resolve the crisis triggered by Trump's withdrawal from the nuclear agreement that limited um, Iran's nuclear ambitions in exchange for renewed economic ties with the rest of the world. I mean, he's engaged in really quite frenzied diplomacy on this front, both in Biarritz at the G7, but also at the UN, and indeed, you know, every other week in, in Paris. Um, uh, you know, in the G7, he invited uh, Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, as a surprise guest uh, at the town hall in Biarritz on the sidelines of the meeting. And in New York the following month, um, during the UN meetings, he, uh, he even got to the point of preparing Trump for a phone call with Rouhani. Uh, and Trump was game. And then Rouhani himself, it was Rouhani who pulled out at the last minute because he did not have the green light from the hardliners um, in Tehran. Now, the question here is, why are the French making this big effort? And it's not for domestic political gain, I think it's fair to say. I, um, I don't think French voters are very concerned about this particular issue. Uh, M Macron's argument is that they should be concerned about this issue because, unlike Trump, he realizes that the crisis in Iran and the Gulf, uh, and don't forget that Iran destroyed uh, Saudi oil facilities and took out half of the country's oil supply um, a couple of months ago, with impunity so far, um, he, he says, and his advisors say, and his government says, that this is really the gravest danger to world peace um, at, at the moment, the most dangerous crisis of the moment in the world. Um, and, you know, he's, he's talking to people who aren't listening, but that is definitely his view. And then there's the issue of Russia and Ukraine. Again, there's not much to be gained, I don't think, in French domestic politics from trying to make peace in eastern Ukraine. Uh, where Russia, you know, having grabbed Crimea, is still running the civil war to destabilize uh, Kiev in the, east of, in the east of Ukraine. But Macron um, has gone out on a limb to court not only Zelensky, but also Vladimir Putin. Um, and that, of course, as we all know, has risked the wrath of Germany and East European capitals because he's being too nice to Moscow, they think. Um, and But whereas Trump was clearly interacting with the Russians and the Ukrainians for domestic political gain, um, as we know from the impeachment hearings. This is not the case, with, again, with Macron. As with Iran, there's nothing really to be gained. Um, and his efforts, interestingly, may finally be bearing some kind of fruit uh, because we're, we've got the first uh, summit of the so-called Normandy Four, which is um, Germany, France, uh, Russia, and Ukraine in Paris a week from, a week from today. And it's the first meeting for, for several years to try and enforce a ceasefire and find uh, a lasting solution. Um, I'm not saying that Macron is not a French nationalist, um, because all French presidents of the Fifth Republic, I think we can agree, are sort of nationalists almost by definition, or that he doesn't press for French advantage in Europe and the wider world. He does. But I think it's his assessment of what constitutes the French national interest that is, that is interesting and what constitutes the broader European interest. That's what marks him out from some of his, his rivals. Um, his, um, his brief... Uh, um, he gave a brief televised address before the G7 um, to try and explain his thinking to the French people um, ahead of that meeting. And he, he said, you know, I'm acting in your name... Um, we're going to talk about all these really important things like uh, wealth inequalities, biodiversity, deforestation, climate change, and peace and security across the world. And he said, when France was hit by terror attacks in 2015, they were prepared in Syria by jihadists. If tomorrow Iran obtains a nuclear weapon, we will be directly con concerned. If the Middle East goes up in flames, we will be affected. If we don't solve the situation in Libya, which is flaring up again today, we will continue collectively to suffer the disaster of migration across the Mediterranean and instability across a large part of Africa. On these matters, I want us to strike useful accords and to defend peace and security. So he is giving a sort of domestic political rationale, which I don't think anybody is listening to, but that's his, um, his, his point of view. Um, so he is, a, um, he is a nationalist, I think, who understands the importance of uh, internationalism. He doesn't want his country to turn in on itself with the kind of isolationist policies that Marine Le Pen of the far-right Rassemblement National uh, has. He, um, he continues to defend his methods, um, the audacity that I was mentioning at the beginning, um, and he <coughs> did not apologize to Merkel or the others for his forthright words on NATO. In fact, he's kind of doubled down on it, on the need to speak frankly about the challenges 
of what he sees as a very dangerous world. So opening the Paris Peace Forum the other day, he said the real risk was, was not him being outspoken, but was laziness or coyness or prudishness of hypocritically not questioning the value of international institutions. We need truth, he said. So he is not um, backing down from his, his uh, overturning of the apple cart and, and shaking things up. Um, is he effective? Uh, I think this is, you know, if, if we understand his, his thinking, the reasons for his thinking, um, that's all very well. But does he actually have the ability to do what he says he wants to do, and can he, can he last? Um, he, he himself uh, said uh, about his rapprochement with, with Putin and, and Russia that, that he wouldn't yield results in 18 months or two years, and some things that he's doing might take five years or even 10 years to, uh, to come to fruition. And I think the, the words of an editorial in, in my paper are quite relevant on this, which is that, uh, so the editorial said this, the French leader has proved better at identifying problems than building alliances to solve them. And, and one, of, one of you here raised this issue of his inability or his difficulty in forming alliances, and I think this is the crucial thing. So he is determined, he's persistent, he's energetic, but he's also very impatient. He tends to take very quick decisions without consultation, and that, of course, has infuriated uh, Germany, France's key partner in the EU, and it's infuriated other governments as well, particularly uh, those, in, those in the East. Um, and uh, we had that issue the other day um, with the poorly signaled uh, rejection of opening the door to Macedonia and Albanian accession to the, to the EU. Um, I think it's uh, probably inevitable that Macron's going to find the going hard, given that uh, he is an increasingly rare example of a centrist liberal in charge of one of the world's major economies. And given that potential partners, Germany being the obvious example, are politically weak or fractured, um, fractured at home. Um, I'm conscious that I'm close to running out of time, but uh, oh no, we're okay. So I'll, uh, I'll just a couple, couple more minutes. Um, uh, so I think he, he's, despite his problems of not being very good at consulting with people, particularly Angela Merkel, uh, he has been quite successful, broadly successful, in pushing forward his agenda internationally. Um, given that his approach, as, as he himself explained, is to sort of demand ten big things and then settle for three and a half. Um, uh, if, you, if you take the latest changing of the guard of the EU, uh, we, we get uh, an example of that. Yes, you know, his first candidate for commissioner, Sylvie Goulard, was humiliatingly rejected by the European Parliament. But his second, Thierry Breton, is uh, certainly a, a candidate of equal stature and got through the parliamentary process and will arguably be just as effective. Uh, and he retains the big portfolio of internal market defense and data uh, that Paris was demanding for its its commissioner. And he also has allies or associates or people he can work with at the head of all the major European institutions, including the, the European um, Central Bank. So Macron's real challenge, I think, um, and again, this came up when it was, we were talking uh, among some of you earlier, is not actually the real challenge to his ambitions is not in uh, Brussels or Washington or Paris, uh, sorry, in um, or Paris, yes, actually, necessarily, but in places uh, in sort of small towns in France or non-metropolitan areas of France where uh, the voters, the citizens, are deeply distrustful of Macron, of some of his elite um, uh, associates, uh, the, the party that he runs is not deeply embedded in, uh, you know, the sort of rural France, in the, the countryside, certainly even outside Paris. It's not very embedded at all. I was in Marseille the other day, and I was struck by how nobody really talked about Macron, whereas in Paris, people tend to talk about, about nothing else. So it is there, it's in Amiens and the towns of villages of, of France that his future uh, will be decided, I think, not so much uh, in international policy, uh, and, but it will have an effect on that international policy. So it's voters there uh, in the rest of France, and we have an election coming up in March, who will decide whether he and his La République en March party get another uh, five years from 2022 to um, pursue their goals.
But that, as they say, is another story. So thank you very much. Um,